Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jordan Templeman. I am the independent candidate for our district of Sandwich North and the Islands. Uh, one of the reasons I chose to run as an independent is I believe that the voices of the constituents need to be the prime um, determining factor for votes in the legislature rather than towing the party line. I've lived on the Sandwich Peninsula all my life and I have a huge passion for the issues that affect where we live. I have, uh, I'm halfway through my political science degree uh, currently and through that uh, political science degree where Mona actually taught me in several classes, um, I have, I've grown to have a huge understanding and appreciation for our political system. I work construction um, currently because I'm taking a semester off to pay for my education. Uh, as well, I am a naval reservist with HMCS Malahat and uh, hopefully your next provincial representative. Uh, representative. Uh, I hope to inspire uh, more youth to get involved in our political system. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Adam Olson. I'm the BC Green candidate. And I thank you, the Sydney Community Association for hosting us this evening to discuss the very important issues, uh, opportunities and challenges facing our riding and our province uh, in the future. Tonight I will offer a distinct difference, a stark contrast between what I and the BC Greens are offering and what is being offered by the political establishment represented uh, by the BC NDP and the BC Liberals. I'm so excited about our platform uh, because we have a hopeful, the BC Greens have a hopeful vision for British Columbia and it's underpinned by our investments in people, our investments in education and uh, climate action because we know that when we take uh, education seriously that we can prepare people for the emerging economy in the 21st century. I'm a twice elected councillor in the district of Central Saanich. I spent two and a half years as the interim leader of the BC Green Party and I'm re ready to represent our riding in the legislature. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well thanks very much to the uh, Sydney Community Association for sponsoring this meeting and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. My name is Harry Holman. Uh, I'm reapplying for my job tonight, uh, which actually is the last official day of my tenure as uh, MLA for Saanich North in the Islands, the first NDP MLA ever elected in this constituency. It is a little bit disconcerting to be described as a mainstream party, having won only three in the last couple of dozen elections in British Columbia. I think there are two things that you should be looking for in terms of your uh, MLA and your decision about who to vote for in this election. You should be looking for an MLA that's willing to stand up for the community and advocate for the, the issues that matter to you. And I think I've walked the talk in that respect. In fact, I think I've been advocating for issues that no other candidate here has been speaking out about. But the second issue that you have to be considering as voters in this election, do you really want to give the Christy Clark government another four years of tenure in this, in this province? I would suggest not. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Roberts. I'm your candidate from the BC Liberal Party. Thank you for coming out on such a wet and chilly evening. It's been a long, long, slow spring and things are slowly warming up. Um, I grew up in the, this riding. I was born here in Sydney at the Rest Haven Hospital, if any of you remember that. I live on Salt Spring now and grew up on that small island. And I'm back now seeking to be a representative for this community. In the last four years since the past election, I've been very involved. I've been chair of the Hospital Foundation on the Gulf Islands. I'm chair of two hospice societies, one where we're expanding to eight beds and providing care for people that approach the end of life. I'm also on the Mary Winspear board here in Sydney, and I'm also on the advisory planning commission for the Islands Trust in the Salt Spring area. I'm looking to take my knowledge of healthcare in the community and some of the needs that we have here into the provincial government. I'm looking forward to being your effective voice in a strong BC Liberal government come May 9th. Rental housing is in extremely short supply and home ownership is out of reach for most young working adults. Provincial and federal governments have recently announced new funding. What is your or your party's housing strategy? Thank you. Well, as a young working adult, I find this being a huge concern. How do we get into the housing market? Uh, what I plan to do to help solve this problem and what I support is a uh, sorry is a change to our current property transfer tax. 
that will benefit those trying to get into the lower echelon of houses rather than the uh, multi-million dollar houses. Right now in BC, when you purchase a property, you pay 1% on the first 200,000, uh, 2% on that between 200 and 2 million, and then 3% on anything past that. Personally, I feel that this is staggered against the average family. Uh, I believe that when you're buying a house under the price of $500,000, you should not be hindered by government taxation. Uh, for a family or young adult trying to get into a housing market, for a $500,000 house, they're paying $8,000 in transfer tax. And I personally believe that $8,000 for that kind of a uh, family can be the difference between buying a house this year or buying it next year when the prices have gone up by another 10%. Uh, to make up for the loss of revenue that of course will happen by cutting any tax, uh, whether it be for lower income housing or not, um, I, I believe that we need to raise the percent that is uh, charged on multi-million dollar houses. We have an adequate strategy that staggers how we do income tax in this country. I see no reason why we can't have an adequate strategy for staggering pop, um, property transfer tax in our province. Thank you. So uh, housing is a basic need, and there's no question that times are tough out there right now. We're hearing it, uh, I'm, I'm hearing it at many, many doors that we're knocking on that folks, uh, that, that housing is unaffordable and that, they, that there's a, a gap in our society um, around a, a adequate housing. Uh, Leilani Farha, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, said this, the view of housing, uh, the view of housing as a human dwelling a place to raise families and thrive within a community has largely been eroded. And over the past four years, we've seen uh, even further, in fact, rapid erosion as, uh, as, the, um, as the housing affordability crisis in the Lower Mainland has started to spill out to other parts of, of, the, uh, of the province. And look, the BC Liberals have been stewards of this uh, housing affordability crisis. They've used it to leverage their strong economy rhetoric, which we've been hearing for the past four years. And Andrew Weaver and others, uh, including the good work of the BC NDP to raise this issue, um, they, the Liberals have said, no, no, there's no problem, there's no problem. And then, and then like the Band-Aid Brigade uh, last summer, rush everybody back to the legislature in order to, to fix the problems that they've been warned about for months and for years. Look, the BC Greens, um, there's a stark contrast here. Everyone has a right to reasonable accommodation, and, and we believe, the BC Greens believe that that's what, uh, that's what we're going to offer, and we're going to have our housing platform out in the, next, uh, in the next short while. But look, there's complex issues around housing. Families, you know, we have to think about education. We think about housing uh, workers and, the, and working class and, and single workers. You have to think about transportation. Seniors, uh, of course, health care. Uh, comes up and homeless, you need to be able to provide the social services. We need to organize our local community around housing. As the, I understand this, as the former chair of planning and development in Central Saanich, I understand the community interests that are at, at play here and the decision making at local government. We had a peninsula housing study done over the past four years, and now that study needs action. We need to bring the leadership together, the municipal, First Nations, Islands trustees. We need a facilitator, and uh, that will be the role that I'll play as uh, the next MLA. We need to organize, we need to prioritize, and then the provincial government will be loath to not recognize us. Back to Farha. We need to get back to that essence, that, human, that housing is a human dwelling. It's a place to raise our families and it's a place to thrive in our community. Thank you. Well, uh, I appreciate Adam, a uh, couple of comments that Adam made. One was the good work that the NDP has been doing in the legislature, and, and the other is to acknowledge the affordable housing needs assessment, which I secured funding from, from a liberal government. Um, in 2013, I identified housing as one of my key priorities that I wanted to work on. It was a key part of our platform in 2013, and I've tried my best to live up to that commitment. Uh, that needs assessment 
uh, had two purposes. One was to document the problem, and while there's been a lot of talk about affordable housing on the peninsula, uh, unfortunately there hasn't been much information around that, and unless you understand the problem, it's very difficult to solve it. So that was one purpose of uh, undertaking the study, which, uh, by the way, was undertaken by the uh, Great Victoria Social Planning uh, Council, Marika Albert. The second purpose of the study uh, was to provide uh, um, affordable housing developers, either for-profit or non-profit, with the justification that they can use to go to funders uh, to seek funding to support their projects. That's the first question that funders will ask at any level, regional, district, uh, provincial, and federal, is, is there a demand to, uh, to, um, to fill the, the project that, that you're building? So that study is available to all proponents, and, and that was the reason for undertaking it. Uh, at the provincial level, we propose what the, the solution to affordable housing, one of the key ones, and of course you can talk about tax incentives, which uh, Jordan has talked about. Uh, there are a number of measures that can be undertaken locally and, and provincially and even federally, but the key part of the, the solution is to actually build affordable housing. And that's what the provincial NDP is promising to do as uh, if we form government in British Columbia, to build tens of thousands of housing units in British Columbia over time. Uh, there are also issues around rent evictions. We need to change the laws around that. There's issues around compensating uh, manufactured home park uh, owners who uh, may be evicted as a result of the owner wanting to sell or redevelop the, the property. But fundamentally, it comes down to building housing. Rental housing is the key thing. Uh, and uh, the key thing also is to have housing agreements that ensure that the rental housing is affordable in perpetuity over time, because otherwise you're just on a treadmill with the market. Market rents will go up, uh, will go up. Housing prices will go up. You really need to break that link with the marketplace, and you can do that with uh, with uh, provincial and federal funding. And as an MLA, I'll work with any government on this issue. Uh, I, I've uh, I've worked with uh, the, the Liberal government on this. And I'll work with that. I'd be more uh, apt and, and would would like to work with an NDP government because I believe in our in our platform. But I'll work with any government on this particular issue, and I've been an advocate for it for four years. Well, one of the issues, of course, we face here in Sandwich North and the islands is that it's a very desirable place to live. That's why we're all here. That's why you live here. That's why I live here. Many more people want to join us. And when you have increased demand for housing, prices tend to go up. But the BC Liberal government has a policy for helping people with housing. We have four basic tenets. Increase housing supply, smart transit expansion, supporting first-time buyers, and increasing rental supply. Now, in the last 12 months, the BC Liberal government has invested almost $1 billion in affordable housing projects. That's an unprecedented 12-month investment in Canadian provincial history. There's 5,300 units of affordable rental housing coming up in the province. BC Housing is a partner on West Saanich Road in the Verdier House redevelopment. They're also building affordable housing at the Marigold Nursery redevelopment in Central Saanich. On Salt Spring just last week, we saw Minister Todd Stone announce 52 new units of affordable housing for seniors and chronically homeless folks. Municipalities also have a role here too, and Sydney has been doing its part, along with Victoria Housing for an affordable housing project here. Central Saanich has been doing its bit as well. And of course, with rentals, we have families under $35,000 income per year are eligible for the Rental Assistance Program, which provides an average of $400 per month per family to help them rent a home. On the buy side, of course, we've seen the implementation last year of a 15% foreign buyers tax trying to cool the market in Vancouver. The provincial legislation there says that that can be brought over to the island and other parts of the province should the need arise. We've also got a home partnership program recently announced for first time buyers. You can borrow up to 5% of the value of your property, interest free for five years, and this will help first time buyers get into the market. Jordan Templeman mentioned that first time buyers looking at a house for 500,000 shouldn't be paying tax. Well, in fact, that's exactly what we do in the BC Liberal government. There is no tax for first-time home buyers on houses up to $500,000. And for anybody buying a newly built home, there is no property transfer tax up to $750,000. We have to recognize we live in a popular part of the country. 
We're taking every measure we can to make sure that housing is affordable for those who wish to buy and for those who need to rent. The BC Liberals are the only one with a comprehensive policy, and I have pages and pages of other programs that people can access as well to help make housing more affordable for them. The investments we're making in affordable housing are unprecedented, as I say, in Canadian history, and I think we're the only party that really has a plan to try and address that and help people find a home for themselves and their families. So the next question is, BC's child poverty rate is one of the highest in Canada. One in five BC children live in poverty, and the rate is one in two children are in single parent families. What is your plan or your party's plan to deal with child poverty? And Mr. Olson, you go first. Uh, thank you. Um, so as a parent with uh, two young children, I've got a four-year-old and a nine-year-old, this issue strikes particularly close to home for me. Um, my children are a large part of the inspiration of why I'm sitting up here uh, putting my name for it as a candidate. And what I've seen uh, over the past four years in, in watching B BC politics closely as the interim leader of the BC Greens um, is really quite, um, well, personally I feel embarrassed. From a province with so much wealth, uh, we should be doing much better than 20% than of our, youth, our children in poverty. Um, we should be doing better than having the highest child poverty rate of any province for, for more than a decade. Uh, we, should be, we should not be the only province with a ch without a child reduction plan. But there are some very serious social and economic implications to poverty and especially impoverished children. The BC Greens, um, the BC Greens have belief that we must look after uh, the, and the health and well-being of all British Columbians and that's what our platform uh, is based around. Look, it's not good enough to have this strong economy rhetoric and then to have children impoverished. Um, I, I also don't believe that we should be using blunt policy instruments necessarily for this. And that's what I think the, uh, the, the $15 an hour minimum wage and the $10 a day daycare are. It's a one-size-fits-all approach that, that I don't necessarily think a $15 an hour minimum wage in tariffs might work, but in the lower mainland in Victoria it doesn't. We need to have more complex uh, a social policy and policy than that. Uh, responding with sound bites isn't, isn't going to be good enough. If you take a look at our plan, the BC Greens plan, what you will find is that the entire uh, first announcements that we've made about uh, our, our policy planks have been about addressing poverty. It's about investments, record investments, bold investments in education because we know that if we look after people, if we look after children and we look after their parents, so that they can be prepared for the new and emerging economy, innovative and creative economy that is not coming but is actually on us, then they will do a, a great deal of, uh, of, of taking care of the child poverty themselves. Yes, we need a child poverty plan, and we've started to release the points of that. It's dealing with climate action, it's investing in education, and it's looking after people. I want to be able to look my kids in the eye and say, that we've looked out for intergenerational equity, that we are leaving them a better world than the one that we inherited. And that's the reason why I'm sitting here today. And these statistics that we see in child poverty are simply not good enough. This is a, an excellent and a very important uh, question. Um, as, the, as the question states, uh, British Columbia does have one of the highest, uh, consistently highest child poverty rate in Canada, which uh, really does um, uh, belie the liberal rhetoric around one of the strongest uh, uh, economies in Canada. Uh, and yet we have the highest child poverty rate, and we're the only province in Canada that doesn't have a poverty reduction plan, which is what the BCNDP proposes, a legislated plan with uh, targets that are that are legislated and uh, and are, are going to be enforced by the legislature. And the, the key parts of that, uh, we're going to increase uh, social assistance and persons with disability rates. Social assistance rates in British Columbia have been frozen at $610 a month for years, as have uh, uh, PWD rates until just recently, until the Liberal government was shamed into increasing them. Uh, we're also going to rescind that bus pass clawback that the Liberals uh, cruelly instated. Um, we, as I indicated before, there's a strong overlap between poverty and affordable housing. We're going to build thousands of units of affordable housing in British Columbia. We're going to fund that 
by a property tax that's configured somewhat differently than the Liberals' property tax. Again, that tax, uh, they were hurriedly uh, called back to, to the legislature after refusing the private member's legislation we proposed, and five weeks later came back with their own property tax that only applies in Vancouver. We would apply a property tax to non-resident uh, folks who own properties in British Columbia, throughout British Columbia, not just new, but existing, who don't pay income taxes in British Columbia. And we're gonna earmark that funding for affordable housing. It's important to have solutions, but it's important to know how you're also gonna fund them. Uh, other aspects, Adam did mention, the $10 a day daycare. We're gonna phase that in over, over a period of time, over a 10 year period of time. To a large extent, that's self-financing, because parents who are having to take care of their kids will be freed up to work in the labor force, they will pay income taxes, they will generate government revenue. The $15 minimum wage we will also uh, phase in over time. It's important to remember uh, the Liberals' mantra about uh, poverty is that we will solve that by creating jobs. There are hundreds of thousands of people working in British Columbia full time at hourly rates that keep them in poverty. So that's very important to keep in mind. We have the financial capacity to help folks at the lower income end, and when we do that, we all benefit from that because those people will we spend that money in the local economy and the provincial economy, we will all be better off as a result of that. And there are other uh, related things as well, like investments in uh, public transit for folks who can't afford or can't afford to use their cars that, that often. Public transit is an important part of the picture as well. Um, let me just uh, say, of course, that um, as long as there are children in poverty, it's not good enough and there's work to be done. We absolutely have to make sure that we reduce the number of children in poverty, and we have more to do. Um, I would say, though, that since 2006, the number of children in poverty in British Columbia has declined by 50%. That's 79,000 children are no longer in poverty. BCs with low, BC residents with low incomes have declined by 162,000 people, and that's down 27%. But we still have more work to do. The BC Liberals believe that one of the best um, poverty reduction plans is jobs. How many of you here have heard of the Single Parent Employment Initiative? Anybody heard of that? A couple of you. The Single Parent Employment Initiative was conceived about a year and a half ago for single parents, where 50% of the, people, of the children who are in poverty are in single parent families. What we wanted to do was try to pull people out of poverty by allowing them to get a job where they could provide for their family. So the Single Parent Employment Initiative provides training in a program that will help train you for a job in the future. It provides childcare for your child. It provides transportation to and from your job. And it continues to pay your social assistance payments, assistance payments while you do this. We've had a huge uptake of over 5,000 people getting into the program. We thought several hundred might apply, but men and women who are single parents have taken up this program. 95% of them are coming out of the program and getting a job immediately. For us, making sure that everybody has a job where they can provide for their family is a critical and single most important piece in any poverty reduction plan. And let me reiterate, we're not done. We have more work to do. We've got to get better, but we've got to think about it and take our time and put in place the best policies that will actually help lift children and families out of poverty. Thank you. Uh, so when combating child poverty, uh, it needs to be a strong balance between prevention and the action that we take today to deal with those living in poverty. I think when we look at prevention, the main focus has to be education. and. Uh, Currently, half of the kids or young adults who get out of foster care, they ha um, a large portion of them don't do not have their dog with diploma when they get out of when they age out of foster care. And one of the problems with this is um, when you don't have a dog with diploma, it's almost impossible to get a good paying job. And even with a bachelor's degree, it can be hard to get a uh, well paying job to support yourself. So, what I, I would plan to do as an MLA to prevent this is by making tuition-free adult education for anyone who needs it for high school uh, education. Um, because without, without that, they can be 
basically stonewalled into not being able to move on and break the cycle of poverty. Uh, the second thing when it comes to uh, the child poverty is we have to help those who are living in it today. And I strongly think this is where we start, we support the parents of those kids in poverty. Currently in BC, there is an early childhood tax benefit that offers $55 a month for children under the age of six. There are two main changes that need to be made to this, in my opinion. The first being that it shouldn't stop at the age of six. It's no good to have a child out of poverty for one third of their life and in it for the next two. In almost every other province in this country, the child tax credit goes to 18. And in some of the provinces, it's even double, or in Quebec, it's triple than our child, child tax credit is here. And the second thing that we need to do to um, change our child tax benefit is uh, we need to tie it to inflation. Currently, it's at $55 a month as a maximum, and it doesn't raise uh, yearly. And cost of living will still raise, renting will still live, uh, raise, food prices raise. So if we're going to provide for people who uh, have children in poverty, we need to be able to uh, give them the funding that goes along with our economy. The third long answer question, how will you or your party support the development of sustain sustainable transportation options for all British Columbians that better serve the Saanich Peninsula? And Mr. Holman starts this one. Oh, thank you. Um, at the provincial level, uh, the uh, BC NDP will be increasing the carbon tax, which uh, is required by the federal government. The federal government has basically said to the provinces, we are moving to $50 per uh, ton CO2 equivalent. And the provinces, if you don't do it, we will do it. So we will be implementing those carbon tax increases, and we will do that in a way that will generate incremental revenue, unlike the liberal revenue neutral approach, under which we've seen GHG emissions increase over the past five years. So we'll be uh, 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 generating incremental revenue and we will be reinvesting in that in strategies and actions that directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Public transit investments will be a key part of that. Um, uh, locally and, and in this region, uh, transit service levels have essentially been frozen for the past seven years, since 2010. The Greater Victoria Transit Commission has requested the minister uh, to increase the fuel tax levy that's uh, earmarked for public transit in the uh, Greater Victoria area from three and a half cents to five and a half cents. In Vancouver, it's up in the 15 to 17 cent range. You have to find, in order to find, in order to improve transit, we need more resources. There's no pot of money that the BC Transit uh, Commission uh, regionally is hiding somewhere. We, if you want to increase transit, if you want to reduce our dependence on automobiles, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you have to have to find a way of funding it. And a, and a gas tax, which the Transit Commission has uh, pleaded for over the past years, has been approved by the CRD board, has been approved by 12 of the 13 municipalities in the Capital Regional District. That's the way um, we can fund transit improvements in the Capital Regional District, and I support that. Areas like the West Sydney Industrial Area have no direct service. The airport, one of the largest airports in Canada, has no direct uh, transit service. Dean Park has no service at all. And, and the First Nations, the service to First Nations on the peninsula is extremely spotty. So, uh, and it also ties into the poverty issue uh, question that I mentioned before. There are lots of people who either can't afford cars or can't afford to drive them uh, frequently. Seniors uh, depend on transit. Uh, disabled folks, uh, handy guards, very important to them. We need to find a way to uh, support increased transit use in the capital region, and I'm the only candidate that's been publicly advocating this for the past four years. So this is actually quite an exciting uh, question, what some of the options are for transportation in British Columbia. Um, in March of this year, the uh, provincial government announced $1.6 billion of initial funding for transit in the Greater Victoria area. Last December, they announced that they would be creating an app, developing an app, 
for real-time bus tracking, which allows people to find out where the bus is and when they should run out and get, get to the bus stop. We've also got some interesting things happening with BC Ferries. BC Ferries, of course, is, brings people to the peninsula. Um, not too many commute, but some do come from the Gulf Islands into the peninsula. And we've got dual fuel vessels that run with natural gas now. The three new vessels from Poland and new vessels that will come next uh, will be able to take regular fuels and as well as natural gas. And we're going to be retrofitting some of our vessels to do that as well. That lowers greenhouse gas emissions, it reduces costs for British Columbians and for people in the riding. There's also, as was announced yesterday morning, a new BC Ferries tax credit which will enable uh, families and individuals on island, in island communities, so that's Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands, to um, deduct up to $1,000 in ferry fares for a $250 reduction in their total tax payments. Um, we've also got legislation or a plan in our budget. Excuse me. To, um, one at a time. Sorry? Just one at a time. Okay. So we have. Um, Plans in the, uh, in the platform for ride sharing. We're going to be introducing ride sharing services to the province. We also have a, a proposal in the Vancouver Island platform that allows for a tax credit for those who use car sharing services such as Evo or Car2Go. There's also our terrific programs around electric vehicles. We have up to $6,000 if you scrap one of your old gas guzzlers and another $5,000 if you buy a new or used electric vehicle. And here in, we have one of, the, uh, one of the most successful electric vehicle sales uh, firms in the country at Motorize, located in West Sydney. People on Salt Spring are buying more and more electric vehicles. They're ideal for travel on the peninsula, and the provincial government is supporting their purchase with grants of up to $11,000 per person to buy one. There's also another $5 million this year for electric charging stations. We have a number of them in Sydney, there are more in Victoria, and we're expanding the network across the province. And I'm sorry that the microphone seems to be cutting out a little bit, but um, there are so many options for sustainable transit that we can look forward to in British Columbia, and we need to make some of these transitions and continue to invest in transit and into uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions services. Thank you. Uh, so regarding transit, this is definitely something I can speak very personally to. Um, between from my house to Camosun campus, on the bus it takes me about an hour and a half to get there. I took the bus for the first two years I was at Camosun, and each semester I was on the bus for just about 200 hours. It's a substantial amount of time. When I got my car in my third year, I found that it was only about a 35 minute commute to Camosun. Uh, it's, it's very hard to convince myself to take the bus and waste an hour of my day. And that's where I think the large problem with our bus transit system right now lies. It's with time and time efficiency. So if we can create a transit system that has faster, um, or sorry, more buses on each uh, route and more routes that are direct to the areas that need them, we can create a system that people use. And when people use the system, it, it tends to ramp it up in more public support for it and more um, revenue is generated from the, uh, from the usage of the buses. Currently, over 75% of the um, funding needed to run our transit system in BC is donated through, or sorry, not donated, is funded through our province and local governments. Less than, I believe it's 18% is actually from the use of the bus, such as bus passes and through um, people going on the bus and I think that's where we need to make it the, the funding come from the government first clearly as it, as it does um, to encourage more people to use it and we can start to get to a point where the funding from usage will start to balance out the funding that the government puts in. Um, I have a I have a smile on my face here because as a former Central Saanich councillor, anybody who's been on a council in Central Saanich uh, over the past 25 years is going to know that we've been dealing with transportation issues um, more than just over the past four years, for the past uh, 25 years. And unfortunately, the provincial government uh, has been ignoring and distract, uh, distracting, uh, requesting uh, corridor studies and then ignoring those corridor studies and going outside and having uh, side conversations. Um, and so no matter what you're hearing about all of these um, shiny programs that are being 
uh, pitch to you tonight, the reality is, is that we still don't have sustainable transportation on the Saanich Peninsula. We still have a housing uh, affordability crisis in our province. We still are not meeting our climate action targets. In fact, we're just forgetting, we're just ignoring them and pretending like they don't exist. So all the statistics and all the packages and all the plans, the fact is, is that the people uh, in our riding and the people across the province are telling us something different at the door. They see through uh, all of the shiny packages. So when we're dealing with uh, sustainable transportation, we're dealing with a much bigger problem, and it's it's climate action. Thirty-seven percent of our of our emissions come from uh, the uh, come from our transportation network. Look, you know, um, former Premier Gordon Campbell was getting it right on climate action, and then uh, Premier Christy Clark shows up and says, "Oh, we don't need to do this." So we went from being a leader uh, to a laggard. And it was just, you know, just six or seven, seven years ago now, or eight years ago now, that we heard from the BC NDP that they were going to axe the carbon tax. Look, the reality of this is that the BC Greens are the only party that is offering a climate action plan and real solutions on how uh, to get to the interim 2030 target uh, so that we can get back on track and we can address climate change. We're doing it through, and, and part of the transportation options that we're going to have on the peninsula here is uh, like a bus rapid transit system, is connections to the neighborhoods that, uh, that Gary highlighted that are not connected. Um, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to put forward zero emission vehicles, uh, incentive, incentives for low and no emission vehicles, expand the network of charging stations. But more than that, it's what the, the point that Jordan made was a key one. I grew up on the Saanich Peninsula. It's about behavior. And when you grow up on the Saanich Peninsula, and it takes you an hour and a half to get downtown on the bus, it's very discouraging. And so we ran out and got our licenses and got our vehicles. And so one of the things that we need to do as a government is we need to uh, utilize the resources to show people uh, the options and to fund other options. Look, the central focus of the BC Greens Climate Action Plan is to help people make the carbon efficient choice the default choice. That's our goal. Thank you. The candidates did not have advance notice of these questions. And the first one to answer is Mr. Roberts for this one. The federal government has strict rules on political donations and campaign spending limits. The donation limit for individuals is $1,525. You have to be a Canadian citizen. And there are no union or business donations anymore federally. Will you or your party bring similar legislation for BC? And Mr. Roberts, you begin. Thank you very much. Um, the BC Liberals have uh, put forward a policy of transparency when it comes to political donations. Within 10 days, our commitment is that all donations and where they come from appears on the BC Liberal website. You as voters can look at it at any time you wish. You can make a decision then to see if you think the party has been unduly influenced by anybody who might have donated there. We also, at the end of the last legislative session, proposed that we should have an independent commission of the legislature to look into party political funding and how we should go forward. Um, as the legislation was going through, the uh, NDP said they would accept nothing short of a complete change of the system and did not actually support the legislation as it was in the House. So we need to move forward, and I advocate establishing that commission once we're re-elected so that we can find best practice in different uh, jurisdictions and apply them here in British Columbia. Certainly there are things that we can do, but transparency, which both of the uh, Green and NDP parties have refused to do so far, is the first step in that. There's no uh, revelations on their website about who's been donating to them in the last 10 years, and you won't find that out until after the next election. The BC Liberals is there for you all to see. So uh, thank you very much for the question. So when it comes to party and candidate contributions, I think it is very straightforward. The only person that should be able to donate to a political party is someone who can vote for it. We should not have unions, we should not have corporations, or any form of special interest group making decisions in our legislature through campaign donations. We should definitely find a way to meet, and we don't even need to find a way, it's obvious, just put it in law, that we can limit these forms of donations and find a way that even for individuals to be limited. Federally, it's just over $1,500 that is a limit per individual. So you don't have billionaires making uh, million, multi-million dollar contributions 
and you end up with the same problem that you would have with corporations making the, uh, making the donations. As, uh, as an MLA, I would definitely support, I would absolutely support regulations following federal standards for, um, for campaign donations. I think this is, should be a nonpartisan debate and we, we need to get the power back into the voters rather than in the hands of uh, corporations, unions, and multimillionaires. Well done. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, hey, you know what? Um, the, the first two minutes is my answer. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jordan. Um, the, the, the reality here is that transparency is not the issue. Um, and this is this is what the BC Liberal Party wants you to think it is. And Christy Clark has been has been very skilled at creating a separate problem and then getting you to focus on that. That's not the issue. You can go and find out who's donated to Gary's party by going to Elections BC. You can go and find out who's been donating to the BC Greens by going to Elections BC. You could go there and find that, uh, for example, thirty-seven about $37,000 was donated by Steelhead LNG to the BC Liberals, a company that doesn't make any money and uh, has made zero revenue and yet they're donating to the BC Liberals for what? And this is what the problem is, is that special interests have lodged themselves uh, into, right into the middle of our political uh, parties. And, and, and so transparency is not the issue, the issue because it already is transparent. Um, the, BC, the, BC Lib, the BC Greens have already shown action. We are the only party sitting at this table tonight that is not accepting corporate and union donations. Not saying if you elect us, we'll do it. We did it. Um, an independent commission, why have an independent commission when so many jurisdictions around the country are getting it right? And all we have to do is take a look at how they're getting it right and do that. Again, it's just another distraction. We need to get special interests out of politics. We need to stop the cash for access and the pay to play that we see uh, being um, both the BC Liberals and the BC NDP participating in. And uh, we need to, as Jordan said, and I agree, and, and we Greens definitely agree with this, get the power back to the people in British Columbia. Uh, thanks very much. Well, I'm very proud to be the uh, critic for democratic reform for the official opposition. Uh, the BC NDP has been proposing private members legislation ever since 2008, six times in the legislature. Uh, and most recently by John Horgan. And uh, that legislation would ban political donations from corporations and unions and establish uh, limits on personal donations, all of which are in place at the federal level, all of which are in place in many of the, most of the larger provinces in Canada. Uh, the NDP government in Alberta, the first piece of legislation they brought through was to do exactly that, was to ban political donations from corporations and unions and set a personal uh, a donation limit. We would go beyond that though. We would outlaw the, the stipend, the arrangement that the Premier has, who's received $300,000 from her wealthy backers, we would outlaw that practice. Elected officials, elected officials, and certainly not the Premier of the province, should not be getting a salary top-up from the Liberal Party for which she is the chief fundraiser. We would also ban, we would also ban donations from non-residents of, of British Columbia. Uh, we would reinstate pre-election spending limits uh, in British Columbia. The Liberals blew those away uh, in 2015. There used to be a spending limit in the 60-day pre-election period, and the Liberals have blown those away, which exacerbates the problem. Uh, Adam and Jordan are right. Disclosure is not the issue. We know, we know who donates to the Liberal government. It's the same wealthy backers and the large corporations who seem to get a lot of those government contracts. It's corruption by any other name, and we will put a stop to it. But folks, I come back to what I said originally. In order to bring in these changes, we need to change government in British Columbia. Both home care and residential care for our seniors seem to be either inadequate or extremely costly. What would you or your party do to make sure that seniors who need care will receive the quality of care they deserve? 
So when it comes to hospital, um, any form of medical or health care, and especially for seniors, it, it comes down to funding. And currently in our province, I don't believe there's enough funding for our health care system. We have a massive lack of doctors, especially family doctors, and it can be extremely hard to get that kind of care. Um, I, I support raising the funding for uh, our, our health care system to the point where we don't have families or seniors without personal physicians for decades and years. Uh, I, I think this is just, we need to get the funding in there. I don't think there's really any other solution without more funding for this. Um, it's, a, it's a really important question how we, uh, how we look after and, and provide services for our seniors and for our elders in our, in our community. There's, there's no question about it. Um, and it's important that, uh, that seniors and, and elders can stay at home for as, as long as possible and that we are providing, um, we are providing that home care. Um, because I know that, it, and watching, uh, during, it was during the last election that my grandmother uh, was coming to the end of her life and, and the difference that it was for her when she was able to be at home to the time that she, um, that she went and left her home was very devastating for her. Um, I, I, I disagree with Jordan. I think that there's a lot of money in our healthcare system. It's about how we're uh, deploying the money. And of course, we've heard that everyone was going to have a GP by 2015, and, and that didn't happen. And also, we've heard that there's a program uh, in place to, to change the primary care system, and, and that hasn't happened. The BC Greens believe in communities of care. We believe in providing uh, teams that work together, much like what's happening here in the town of Sydney. And it's it's really unfortunate that that primary care facility had to go to the municipality to get supported and not to the provincial government to find the support that they needed because I have actually, I've heard from a lot of people that who didn't have uh, health care, a lot of seniors who didn't have health care uh, are now going to that new facility on Bevan Avenue and they're getting access to the, to the GPs. And so it's important for us to have GPs. But we don't always need to see a GP for every single question that we have. We do it very well in the emergency room where you meet at an RN, they triage you, they find out where you need to go, and then, and then they deploy those healthcare services. And we should have that uh, in our communities as well so that it's not necessarily a GP that needs to see everybody. Perhaps it's a nurse practitioner. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, the, uh, the BCNDP platform will include substantial investments in uh, home care and nonprofit residential care for seniors. Um, Adam's right that um, not only do those kinds of facilities do a better job taking care of seniors than having them sitting in acute care beds in hospitals, uh, but it's a much more cost of effect, much, much more cost effective way of taking care of people. Uh, and so we have the resources, we've got the financial capacity to do it. It's, it's only a matter of will. Uh, it, it's interesting, just uh, today I read that BC, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives just done an analysis of exactly this and found that um, access to home care and residential care in British Columbia on a per capita basis has, has actually declined substantially in British Columbia since 2001. And not only is that bad for seniors in terms of the best way to take care of them, um, but it's also the less cost-effective way to take care of seniors. Uh, we are also, I totally agree with Adam, that the uh, provincial government needs to be supporting uh, community care clinics. We need to have our healthcare system focused around community care clinics, which have a range of services provided, not just doctors, but nurse practitioners, other practitioners who can provide services, again, at a lower cost. The provincial government should be supporting those kinds of investments. And the way to pay for those things, folks, is to take back the, uh, the income tax breaks for the top 2% income earners in British Columbia, which uh, the BC Liberals conferred on them in 2015. $230 million a year tax break 
for the top 2% income earners in British Columbia. We're also going to take back the 500 million that's in the BS LNG Prosperity Fund, and we don't even have an LNG industry in, in uh, British Columbia. We're going to take those in those dollars as well and invest them in public services. So I think the question is about uh, long-term and residential care and how do we care for seniors as they age. Of course, our population of seniors is aging dramatically and will continue to do so over the next 30 years. That's why in the uh, latest budget, the provincial government announced a further $500 million annually in specific supports for seniors in home monitoring and home care services. Part of that will include another 1,500 healthcare staff to visit and attend to seniors as well. The MSP cut uh, helps seniors incredibly. At the end of this year, MSP premiums will be reduced by half. That helps to keep seniors at home. At, on Salt Spring, I'm at uh, Salt Spring Hospice, and we share space with a program of the provincial government called Better at Home, which seeks to keep people in their homes as long as possible by <coughs> providing home care supports. The uh, new facility for primary care in Sydney, uh, the Peninsula Medical Center, I think it's called, was actually started with seed money from the GP for Me program. And just last week, our health minister announced that there would be further resources to help establish primary care facilities in other communities around the province. On Salt Spring, I'm involved in setting up a community primary care center where we want to attract physicians to our communities. The fact is that doctors have changed the way that they practice somewhat, and we're going to need more and more doctors. The uh, British Columbia Liberal Platform that was announced this morning proposes to have another 400 spaces annually for medical uh, doctors graduating from our schools, with many of them being here in Victoria. So we are working for seniors, we are adding more and more resources, we're improving healthcare spending. $4.2 billion is going into healthcare over the next three years, and that doesn't even include the capital expenditures. It's important that we have a robust economy if we're going to be able to look after all of our seniors. We appreciate how much they've contributed to the province, and it's vitally important that we now look after them. Thank you. Well, I'm sure everybody really appreciates how the candidates are keeping to their time, and timekeepers are doing a wonderful job. So we'll get through many questions. Uh, the next one starts with you, Mr. Olson. Where are the jobs now in BC, and how will you, or your party, prepare young people to be employed in the kinds of jobs that allow them to have homes, and if they choose, to have families? <coughs> Uh, this is a fantastic question because because uh, actually our economy is changing very very quickly. In fact, uh, it's cha changes over a weekend. There's there's different uh, innovative and creative technology technologies that are being uh, being developed in, in in incubators and in uh, in our communities uh, all throughout British Columbia. Look, um, we have been clinging to a sunset industry. We were pitched in the last election that we would have 100,000 jobs in LNG and that everything, we'd have gold-plated streets. And we know that that did not happen because oil and gas is a sunset industry. It is at its end. And making investments in that industry, especially uh, for the export markets is really not the kind of, of, of investments that we need to be making. Look, with automation, with technological advances, climate change, global political instability, resource depletion, our, our economy needs agility. And you know what, we need to be able to rapidly change. And unfortunately, um, what both uh, the, the establishment parties and our, both the status quo parties in our province have been focused backwards when what we need to be doing is preparing the economy by looking forward and that is fundamentally the very bold investments that we made in education. I invite you to go and look through our education plan because our, our future economy, I'm going to have 15 jobs in my career. That is so different than the generation before me and so different than the generation before that. And so it's going to require that we have a robust education 
um, uh, of robust education programs in our province so that uh, people like myself and like Jordan and like, and, and like my parents can get in and out of the, uh, the economy and get retooled and reskilled as jobs change in this, in this province. So we look forward to clean tech, high tech, and the creative, innovative, emerging economy to create the jobs of the future. Uh, so the question about jobs in British Columbia, um, we propose to use uh, uh, dollars that government is already spending on, on uh, health care, on uh, information technology, uh, those kinds of things to stimulate jobs in local economies. So an example of that, uh, consider the IT failures of this Liberal government where hundreds of millions have been spent on IT systems, for schools, for uh, the, um, the, uh, social, uh, the uh, social workers in British Columbia. Uh, we are going to use uh, government spending to stimulate uh, local information technology businesses. We have the capacity to do that kind of work. We don't have to ship it out to multinationals. Another example uh, is we're going to stimulate uh, food production, local food production, by requiring public health facilities and, and uh, eventually other public institutions to buy a portion of their uh, food requirements from local producers. And that would be, uh, that would be greatly helpful here on, on the peninsula. Uh, ferry fares, we're going to uh, address ferry fares which have doubled in, on the minor routes uh, over the past decade, has sucked uh, tens of millions of dollars of those local economies, and we're going to address that issue directly, not the uh, tax credit uh, giving that the Liberals are now proposing. A fair tax system is also going to stimulate spending, because if we can help folks at the lower end of the scale, they are going to spend all of that money in the local economy, we'll be much better off as a result of that. And uh, raw logs in British Columbia. Under the Liberal government, raw logs exports have taken off exponentially in British Columbia. We are going to ensure that any local mills requiring logs are going to get those logs, and we will do away with ministerial interference with the process that's used to determine whether local mills need logs. So those are some of the examples that the NDP would uh, bring in. But again, we need to change government to do that, folks. So indeed, the jobs of the future are in technology. Here on Vancouver Island, we've got an incredible technology base, in fact. Technology is Victoria's number one employer, for example. We've got $3.15 billion in revenue from $4 billion in economic activity, employing 23,000 people in the Victoria area in 884 companies. That's technology on Vancouver Island, ladies and gentlemen. Technology in British Columbia now employs more people than mining and forestry combined. We've been making this transition and this change by investing in technology and in education that allows us to compete globally in the technology world. Our education system is now undertaking a program where every child will learn coding so that they come out of the system literate in the new world of technology. Those are the kinds of investments we need to continue to make to make sure that British Columbians are in fact able to take the jobs of the future. In terms of forestry, we're investing by creating new truckers uh, tax credit in the current Vancouver Island platform. Raw logs exports are only made once mills in British Columbia have said they do not need them. That's in the provincial legislation. They're not exported unless the mills have declined them. We're encouraging mills as well to set up and do processing here in the latest Vancouver Island platform. We're eliminating PST for all sawmills and bulk mills on the island and in the province, in fact. So the way forward, of course, is technology and incentivizing some of the industries that are historic industries here, like forestry and agriculture. We've got $500,000 in the Vancouver Island platform today for commercialization of contained aquaculture on the North Island. We want to make this viable so that we can have salmon farming on land rather than in the water. There's a number of things we can invest in. We continue to need to have a robust economy that generates the revenues to allow us to invest in the jobs of the future that's going to support British Columbian families. When it comes to jobs, it's, at least in BC, it's not about a lack of jobs, it's about a skill gap. Many of the jobs that are available, we don't have people to fill them. Um, we, we need to fund education in the sectors that 
we, we see growth and we see a lack of employment in those sectors. We need to have, instead of just um, giving, uh, sorry, instead of just giving uh, grants and loans to all forms of education, we need to focus on the sectors that are being grown in our province. As well, when it comes to our resources and exporting them, yes, resource exportation, it takes, uh, it has a lot of jobs aligned with it, but it's about refining our product before we send it over. If we can refine our product, we can, um, we can grow uh, jobs in mills and in refineries for oil and gas. We are no longer just a supermarket for resources in Canada. We, we do more than that in, uh, in Canada. We, we uh, sorry, uh, we, we can create products that the world wants. It's not just about, um, just about raw logs or about crude fishermen. It's about refined oil and gas and um, processed lumber. We are already up to question number seven. What is your position on the proposal for the Malahat floating LNG plant on Saanich Inlet? And this one starts with Mr. Holman. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I publicly oppose uh, the Steelhead LNG uh, project for months now. Uh, I announced that opposition, in fact, on the Sartlet Reserve at an event uh, being sponsored by the Sierra Club. Um, I did that for a couple of major reasons. I mean, you couldn't think of a worse place to locate an LNG facility uh, in, in this area of the world. Uh, but also the four Wasanich uh, First Nations have made it absolutely clear that they oppose this project and if push comes to shove, they will, um, they will initiate litigation against it. Uh, the NDP is not necessarily against LNG development done responsibly. The steelhead LNG plant is not an example of that. Again, you couldn't think of a worse place to put such a facility, one of the most uh, one of the busiest waterways in British Columbia. It crosses BC Ferries routes. Uh, they're, they're building a pipeline, an underwater pipeline, from the mainland, from Washington State, across to the Saanich Inland. Why would a company do that? It makes no sense at all, except that the regulations in Canada around uh, exclusion zones, safety exclusion zones for both tankers and facilities um, appear to be much, much weaker than they are in the United States, so I think that's uh, part of the game here. I, I oppose this project, and I will do everything I can to stop the project. Uh, by the way, just the, the context for it, though, is our environmental review process, which is terribly broken in British Columbia. It's being corrupted. The Shawnigan Lake uh, facility is an example of that. We need to fix that process. And part of the fix is to have a pre-screening so that industrial projects actually go through some kind of pre-screening process so that the proponent isn't picking the site. Uh, the same uh, is, is applies to the Petronas uh, facility at Lady Island, where again, you couldn't think of a worse location, built uh, over top of eelgrass beds, supporting the second largest salmon run in North America. We need to fix that process. Uh, while the BC Liberals are supportive of an LNG industry in British Columbia, not every LNG project is the same. Locations are critically important. We also have a robust environmental review process that will be looking at any proposals for LNG projects. Oh, 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 absolutely oh, oh. true. <laughs> absolutely true. We'd like, to hear the we'd like to hear the answers from the candidates. Yes. So the, uh, the proposal from uh, the Steelhead Group is that exactly a proposal. It's a proposal to bring gas from the northern parts of British Columbia down to the United States, put it into a pipeline that hasn't been built, send it over to Vancouver Island, put into LNG, to put into tankers, and send it off. It sounds highly unlikely. And as someone who's been involved in the investment banking business, I've seen plenty of projects floated and dry, and they never come to fruition. Both the NDP and Green candidates here are on the same side as me. We don't think this is ever likely to happen. What I have been finding out on the doorstep is people are more concerned about other relevant issues, like we've been discussing earlier this evening, about, well, how, what they're about housing about. and affordability. That's what we've been finding when we've been going out knocking on doors. As recently as yesterday, I was knocking on doors, and the issues that came up were healthcare and how we keep our economy going and how we continue to provide for families and people in British Columbia. So a hypothetical project about which we know very few exact details 
is not something that's motivating most people at the moment. Uh, with LNG in the Sanch Inlet, it, it all comes down to public consultation. It's, it's not necessarily about whether we want a large um, LNG project happening in our area. Uh, sorry, it is about whether or not we want this happening in our area. We live here. We're the ones that will be seeing these tankers. And we're the ones that have to live um, with a pipeline under our ocean. Now, to be, uh, to be honest, the pipeline under the ocean, when it's LNG, it's not actually as dangerous as crude oil or anything like that. It's LNG, it's gas. It, if there is a leak of a pipeline, it goes up and evaporates, which is positive in the form that it doesn't harm the environment, but still, we do have now, if the project goes through, which, as I agree with the other three candidates, is unlikely, um, it's not as bad of an environmental impact. But once again, regarding any form of project, whether it be um, a gas pipeline, a oil pipeline, the, the number one concern has to be public consultation. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be the I'm going to be the one person on this stage that says it is happening because it is happening. When you have a company that's made zero dollars in revenue, and perhaps an investment banker can help me out on this, made zero dollars in revenue, donate thirty-seven thousand two hundred dollars to the government in power, I'd say that's happening. There is absolutely nothing hypothetical about this project. This is, the, this is one of the only projects in which the company is still hiring executives. That's a project that's going forward. That's a company that's investing in their proposal. So to hear tonight that, oh, it's highly unlikely to happen, is, is actually really problematic. Because the job of the MLA is to let people know about what their rights are, to let people know about major industrial projects that are being proposed in their backyard, to let people know about the environmental assessment process, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency, the National Energy Board processes. That's the job of the MLA. And you know, I'm hearing that people are concerned about this when I'm talking on the doorstep. I'm hearing that, and I'm also, and I'm also hearing that there's very low level of information, and I think that that's a failure. We need an MLA that's going to inform the public about this very real project. I grew up in the Sandwich Inlet. I fished just feet away from Bamberton. I agree with Gary, I can't think of a worse place to have this project. But I didn't take months to say that. I took minutes. I was standing there on August the 20th, 2015, saying this project will never happen. But it's not going to not happen because this company doesn't have anything invested in it. It's going to not happen because we know about it, because we're informed about it, and because we voice our rights and our interests in that environmental assessment process. So I will be your MLA that facilitates your knowledge about this project because it's not good enough. The apathy that, that the other candidates are saying that we should have around this project should not be what is going on in this community. Thank you. And question number eight. What will you or your party do to attract and keep family doctors? And Mr. Roberts begins this one. Thank you for the question. As I think I mentioned earlier, I've been involved with a uh, setting up a primary care center in my community on Salt Spring Island. The way doctors practice currently is somewhat different from the way they used to many years ago. Um, used to be you signed up for a practice and it was pretty much a life sentence. You were a doctor for the people on your list for the rest of your life. It was difficult to take a vacation, it was difficult to take a day off, it was difficult to actually retire. They weren't able to get away, but doctors are like many people these days. They want to take that six-week vacation in Belize where they can kayak around the beautiful tropical waters. They want to collaborate with other doctors in an environment that allows them to share and trade experiences and look at diagnoses together. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Doctors um, are coming out of medical school and some of them want to be part-time. Some of them decide to have a family. Women doctors in particular take some time off and, and have a family themselves. That means we need more doctors for the population that we have. Our aging population also means we need more doctors. 
So we have to think of ways to motivate them and get them to come to our communities. By setting up a facility such as they've done in Sydney on Devon Avenue, which is terrific, you've got a collaborative environment where doctors can come and work with each other, take time off when they need to, support each other in their diagnoses and in their profession, and they're gonna stay here longer. When you come out of med school, you might have debt. You certainly don't have money to buy a new practice. You're looking for somewhere to hang your shingle. There aren't too many of those places around. That's why the BC Liberal government has announced a policy last week of trying to facilitate community centers like the one on Bevan Avenue so that we can get more family physicians to come and practice. There's a lot of things we need to do in healthcare, a lot of more creative things we can look at to attract physicians, to make better use of nurse practitioners, to see how we build through MSP. There are so many different things we can look at. How do we engage uh, private enterprise, for example, to provide some of those services with, of course, the province continuing to pay? Thank you. So just as every one of us does when we work a job, we have the freedom to go and work in a place that pays us a higher salary or gives us better benefits. And I think that's what we see a lot of the time with many of our general practice or other doctors. They leave to places like the States where they're being paid more than they get paid here in BC. If we want to keep doctors here, we need to A, make it so when they graduate med school, they don't have a massive amount of debt forcing them to work in a place that pays them higher, and B, pay them enough here that they will stay. Because, I don't know about you, but if I were to have an option between um, a twice as much salary in another country or what we get paid here in Canada for doctors. Uh, I, as a young um, postgraduate, I would most likely take the higher paying job for several years before I come back and live in this beautiful area. And so that's why, where I believe our medical system fails. We need to pay more to our doctors so that they stay, because if they get paid more somewhere else, they're just going to leave. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question, and I, I believe I did start to answer part of this in terms of how healthcare is delivered, in that, you know, if you take a look at the Salish Sea and focus only on the orca and, and the extinction of the orca, then you're going to miss all of the other species that are, that are problematic, like the, like the Chinook salmon that feed. So it's important that we can focus on, on um, MD for everybody in, by 2015, and you, you see that Liberals walked that one back because they weren't able to deliver it, but we need to have a much uh, more integrated uh, healthcare delivery, like I was saying in the last answer, where you have uh, people going into the, the, the clinic that's being proposed in Sydney as an example, and they're, and they're meeting up with, uh, with a, being triaged by a nurse, and you're finding out what the issue is, and then you're going to the appropriate healthcare uh, provider. Look, we've had so many promises on this and so little delivery. The BC Greens will focus on health and prevention first, so that we can minimize the number of trips that people need to be making to the doctors. We will be looking at the way that the health authorities have been funded, the amount of money that we're spending, and the outcomes that we're getting from that. Um, but it's important that we don't just look at the healthcare issues and focus on uh, the, the fact that we have a low number of MDs. That is a problem. We need to train more. We agree we need to make sure that they're being compensated. And I think that it's important that not everybody here uh, feels uh, as, as uh, has the ability uh, to go away for six weeks to police. Um, I haven't done that in, a, in a, ever. So. Uh, oh, thanks very much for the question. Uh, I, I do believe that, um, uh, and I'm not an expert on on the issue, and I'm creating our platform on the issue as well. But I do believe that uh, part of the solution is through uh, community clinics with uh, integrated models of uh, healthcare delivery uh, that rely on uh, more salaried uh, physicians. Uh, because you can direct salary to physicians about where to go uh, that rely more on nurse practitioners and other practitioners to take the, uh, the burden or take the reliance off of doctors. Uh, investments in, in home care and residential care, uh, much more cost effective, do a better job, and also reduce the reliance on the acute care system, which is very doctor uh, oriented. We need to look at foreign credentials. Um, we need to um, try to enable, uh, for, we need to try and eliminate um, arbitrary uh, boundaries or obstacles to having uh, foreign physicians 
uh, working here in British Columbia. So there's a number of, of uh, ways to address the problem, uh, but uh, I, I do uh, agree that uh, uh, doctors are just part of the health health delivery issue in, in British Columbia, and we need to have a broader view. Yes, we do need uh, more doctors, but we need to be trying also to uh, provide care in a more cost-effective way that's less reliant on doctors and use professionals who, in many instances, uh, can provide the level of service that we need without relying on doctors. And by the way, I want to make a confession here. I don't have a GP. And <laughs> I'm, I'm using walk-in clinics in Sanderson. I'd be very lucky uh, with my health uh, situation, but uh, I, I uh, share the concern around lack of doctors because I don't have one myself. Uh, the next question goes to you, Mr. Templeman, first. What will you or your party do to protect islanders from increased ferry costs? Yes. <coughs> so, to be entirely honest, uh, increased ferry costs has not been a prime issue in my campaign. I am a one-man show here, and I haven't had the time to research every issue. Clearly, by the public opinion of BC Ferries, this is something that is very, very important, and I promise I will be looking more into this, and I will release my campaign and uh, or my platform on this soon. If you ever have any questions, please contact me about it, but uh, currently I do not have answers for this uh, solution. Definitely sometimes the best answers. <laughs> I don't have an answer, that's fantastic. Um, more of that should happen in Victoria, actually. Um, <laughs> I'll just say, uh, the, the BC Greens view uh, the BC ferry system as we view an, a, a chunk of highway connecting um, Vanderhoof to the rest of the province. The fact of the matter is, is that it's a marine highway system, but we also see it as a marine transit system, and I think that that's where we've, where we've um, gone wrong. Look, the fact is, is that on you know, many of the Gulf Islanders, this is a, a, an extreme, well, every Gulf Islander I've talked to, this is an extremely emotional issue for them. Because this is how they connect their home to the rest of the province. And again, we talk about the lack of security in our homes, and you know, the, the BC Liberal government did their, did their very best to, pub, to, to just privatize BC ferries. And we're finding out that it didn't work. You know, and they, they're sending off the shipbuilding to uh, to Poland, when we could be investing in our in our shipbuilding industry and expanding our shipbuilding capacity here. Look, this is about a third of our provincial economy is uh, is locked in the coastal communities. So a, a, a government that's actually looking after the BC economy is looking after coastal communities, and I don't think any coastal community of people that live in it are feeling too thrilled about their BC Liberal government right now. Um, this is about tourism and attracting people to our home so that they can visit it, so that they can, so that they can take in the beautiful uh, common spaces that we have and the, and the surrounding environment and the ecosystems that sustain us. So look, I think that we really need to go back to where it was that BC Ferries is part of our marine highway system. It's also part of our transit system and investing in it makes sense just the same way as we invest in any other part of our economy. Well, for the past four years, I think uh, questions in the legislature and question period from Claire Trevina and myself, I'm the deputy critic, and Claire is the critic. I think questions on ferries are probably uh, were, were more than just about any other issue um, in, in question period. And we've uh, watched the minister, Minister Stone, stonewall us on uh, the pleas from uh, particularly from minor routes. Uh, many of those, most of those routes have, have had their fares more than doubled. Uh, and it's more than just an emotional issue in terms of the, the connection of, of islanders uh, to the mainland or to Vancouver Island. It's the single most important aspect of their economy that's being so damaged by this liberal government. They have quite literally sucked hundreds of millions of dollars out of those economies, out of those coastal economies over the past 15 years uh, by essentially privatizing BC ferries. It's been an abdication of their responsibility uh, to that important uh, service that was established by WAC Bennett decades ago. 
there's been a complete abdication of responsibility on this on this issue. Uh, if the BC NDP forms government, will be addressing the fair issue directly, not the tax gimmick that's being thrown at, at uh, electors at the last minute to try and save a few votes uh, in Vancouver Island. We're going to be directly going at the issue. We're going to be looking at more than just residents. Visitors, we want visitors to come to Vancouver Island, to come to those Gulf Islands and spend money as well. And we're going to have stronger government oversight over this Crown Corporation. We're going to look at those administrative and management costs in BC Ferries because we think there are savings to be had there that can be reinvested. UBCM study done uh, just a, a year or so ago, uh, the Minister Stone completely ignored. Uh, estimated that BC Ferries generates about two and a half billion dollars. BC Ferries related traffic, two and a half billion dollars in the BC economy, more provincial government revenue than the province actually spends on ferries. So I'm a Gulf Islander. I grew up on Salt Spring. I live on Salt Spring currently. My dad worked on the Long Harbor Ferry that sailed from Salt Spring to the mainland. So I have a very soft spot for ferries. Um, they're important to our coastal communities. They're absolutely vital to what goes on on the coast here. I think the BC ferry system that we have now is world leading. It's never been better. We're able to invest in new ferries. We've got three new ones coming this year that will be serving the Southern Gulf Islands and the Sunshine Coast. We place the orders where it was cost effective because we have taxpayers and people who live on the Gulf Islands to answer to. We can't continue to put fares up. In the last two years, they haven't gone up for coastal communities. Last year, the 1.9% increase was offset by a surtax that more than covered it. This year, there is no increase on the Southern Gulf Islands ferry fares. Yesterday, the BC Liberal government announced that they wanted to do something for ferry-dependent communities. The island candidates like myself got together and said, let's recognize that ferries are vitally important to the coast. That's why we're planning to have a loyalty program for ferry users on the coast and in the meantime, because BC Ferries is not ready in terms of their IT infrastructure to run a loyalty program, we're going to have a tax credit. But the idea is to have the loyalty program up and running by 2020. We're going to continue to invest in BC Ferries. Last year and this year, they've been full. I've failed to get on a ferry multiple times when I've been trying to come over here to do things. When you have a robust economy and people are feeling good, they get on our ferries and they get out and they explore our products. The ferries are a wonderful system and we're investing in them so the island communities will continue to be able to benefit from great service, world-leading best service. How do you plan on balancing the environment and have a sustainable, have sustainable economic growth while still helping those less fortunate and not raising my taxes? Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I can scramble the right notes quick enough to answer this. I mean, I mean, look, I think that it's really important that we're um, making in, making investments in education. And the reason why I say that is because actually our economy is changing quicker than government can keep up. And and government has been very good at focusing at four year cycles, four year cycles. Just get us reelected. Just get us reelected. I mean. We hear it tonight, right? 16 years the BC Liberals have been in power and they're making promises, like last minute promises, right at the very end, just splashing money into the pot like a, like a poker player, hoping, hoping, that, uh, the, hoping that the final card is going to be one that lifts them up and takes them over. The reality here is that we need to invest in our people. We need to make sure that we are preparing our citizens, uh, young and old, for the new economy, the emerging economy, which doesn't look anything like the 20th century economy. Just the same way as the 20th century economy didn't look anything like the 19th century economy. And we should be proud of that. But we cannot sit back and continue to make the same 20th century choices and the same 20th century decisions, thinking that it's going to be good enough for, for, for my generation and for my kids. Because it's not. And that's what the BC Green Party offers, is a 21st century, century solution. A 21st century option. That is the critical difference that I, am, that I started out this evening by highlighting. That we are the 21st century option, not the status quo. And you know what? Changing government looks a lot better when you've got more greens in there. 
It looks a lot better because there's more accountability in that place. And right now, majority governments need multiple layers of accountability so that they do what they say they're going to do. We've had too much experience of a BC Liberal government making promises at election time and not delivering in the ensuing years, and that needs to end. Well, I couldn't agree with the last part more, but the last part of that statement. Um, I have a different opinion about who could uh, who could change the channel eventually. And we're going to come back to that issue, folks. We're going to come back to the issue of who should be uh, forming government in British Columbia. So, um, yeah, it's it's a tall order, but that's why you pay us the big bucks. So, I, you know, one of the key issues in terms of in, in the environment is climate action. Uh, that it is the most serious issue of our time, and I've indicated before that we're going to be increasing the carbon tax as required by the federal government, reinvesting in public uh, transit, and uh, actions that directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but the good news there is that those kinds of investments make a lot of economic sense as well. For example, take conservation retrofits, which we will be also reinvesting carbon tax revenues in. It makes a lot of economic sense to reduce your energy costs, and, and that's where the economy and the environment can overlap. In terms of poverty, we need to make the tax system fairer, so we're proposing to roll MSP premiums uh, into the tax system, as I believe the Greens are as well. $10 a day daycare will be transformational, and it will be partly self-financing because it will free up parents to work in the labor force. Those kinds of investments are good for poverty, uh, but they're also good for the economy. Affordable housing, another good example, affordable housing will create tens of thousands of jobs in, in British Columbia. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned that I've been advocating for, I'm the only candidate here advocating for, in terms of a vision for this area, is a national marine conservation area for the southern strait of Georgia, a long-standing proposal that's gone underground because the Conservative government refused to support it. That's the direction we need to go to protect our environment, to be co-managed by First Nations. That's the vision that actually the Great Victoria uh, Chamber of Commerce and the BC Chamber of Commerce are now supporting it because they know it will be good for business. So it's not impossible to square the circle that was just described for us in that question. Sorry, Ron, would you mind repeat, repeating the question? <laughs> How do you plan on balancing the environment and have a sustainable and have sustainable economic growth while still helping those less fortunate and not raising my taxes? Well, I think that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 16 years. In British Columbia, we have the highest economic growth in the country. We have the lowest unemployment. In Victoria, for example, we have the lowest unemployment of any city in the country. We're also world leading in some of our environmental um, projects. The carbon tax. We were recognized by the UN last fall for world leadership in establishing a revenue neutral carbon tax. We also just established the Great Bear Rainforest which the Queen herself put into the Commonwealth Canopy Project for preserving forested areas on the planet. At the same time, we've got these economic benefits. At the same time, we have the lowest income taxes in the country for middle-class earners. That is a successful government by any measure. That's what we need to continue to do if we're going to provide for our families of the future, if we're going to continue to protect our environment, we're going to need to have a robust and strong economy. The Vancouver Island platform here that was issued this morning, recognizes that we have special needs on Vancouver Island as well. There are investments in agriculture, in aquaculture, and in forestry. There are protections for our environment. Those are all things that we can do with a robust economy. You can't add $4.2 billion to healthcare spending over three years without having a robust economy. You can't have $2.7 billion in capital spending plans over the next three years for the healthcare system without a robust economy. The AAA credit rating that British Columbia has is not just something esoteric. It's a very real, very real qualification we have as a province that allows us to borrow at the lowest cost possible, lower than anywhere else in Canada. Those are the fruits of the hard work we've put in the last 16 years, writing our economy to get to this point. We want to continue to invest in British Columbians. We want to continue to invest in families. We want to continue to protect our environment. We want to continue to have nation-leading growth, world-leading environmental policies, and the lowest taxes you can possibly have.
that's why you need to do Greenish um, liberal, BC liberal government again. So I'm just going to send it right back to you again, Mr. Robert. Oh, sorry, Jordan, did I forget you again? How <laughs> can I forget my own student? <laughs> Mr. Tuckerman, I'm sorry. Well, I hope I'm not that forget about the voting booth. <laughs> Uh, well, to the question of balancing our uh, environment and our economy, I think we need to look at every single project uh, individually. We can't just have flat regulations on all, um, whether it be oil and gas um, projects. We need to look at them individually. So, to look at one that I'm sure is on everyone's mind right now is the Kinder Morgan expansion pipeline. It, in my opinion, a, a proper balance is not what we're seeing with the proposal. We are seeing um, an in, a growth in our export of crude bitumen oil. And crude bitumen is a lot different than just refined gas, especially when we're transferring over ocean. A proper balance between having that pipeline and our environment would be to refine all of our product before we send it over. And yes, I know that we are um, currently still sending uh, bitumen over the um, uh, through our strait, but uh, it, the increase would be, uh, the risk is not worth our economic boost that we would gain from it. Um, the, the second part to balancing a good uh, economy with our environment is uh, the carbon tax. We have one here and it, it's, I, I believe the carbon tax in itself is a, is a positive thing. But more importantly, um, what percent the carbon tax will be at, or how much we're charging, is where that money goes. We need to have all revenue raised by carbon tax go directly towards green energy, whether that be sol uh, solar, tidal, or uh, wind, or even hydro. It, it can't just go uh, straight into general revenue and, and pay off our, our deficit. We need to use it directly to uh, make it so we don't need to rely on the fossil fuel industry as much. to the end of the questions. We've ha had them answer three questions that they knew ahead of time and seven questions for which they had no knowledge whatsoever before they answered. So now it is on to the three minute uh, concluding statements and we'll start in reverse order. Mr. Roberts, we'll start with you and we'll work our way back. Thank you. I don't know if that last bit was our concluding statements, but thank you for three more minutes. <laughs> Um, I think we have an enviable record in British Columbia on the environment, on the economy, on healthcare, on education. We've delivered world-leading outcomes and life expectancy, world-leading outcomes in cancer survival rates, world-leading outcomes for education in reading and in science. We've also got, as I said earlier, world-leading recognition for some of our environmental projects. We've brought the rest of the country to the table in terms of a carbon tax. The Prime Minister has negotiated a carbon tax across the country with BC insisting that no one in BC should have to pay more than people in other parts of the country. The Prime Minister agreed, and now we have a national program. Some of the things we're doing with the environment are part of that national program. There are some trade-offs, there are some balances. If we have a Kinder Morgan pipeline, we can get Alberta on side to stop producing electricity by burning coal. We can then get a carbon tax in Alberta, which they had resisted for so long, and get the rest of the country to follow suit. We've got to continue to work together as a nation. We've got to continue to work together in British Columbia to advance some of these causes. I'm very passionate about healthcare. That's one of the areas I'm particularly interested in. I'd like to get involved and see that we look at ways to do this better, so that we can get even better outcomes, so we can make our dollars go further. Revise MSP. We can't have salary doctors. Doctors don't want to work that way. Doctors need to be encouraged, and we need to attract them to stay in this province. The BC Liberals have doubled the number of medical space, school spaces during their time in office. We're taking it up again to 400 every year. We also admit doctors from other parts of the world on return for service contracts, where we send them to rural and remote communities that often don't have physicians. All of that takes work, it takes time, and it takes a consistent effort to continue to work for the benefit of all British Columbians. The reason I want to get involved with this political party is because I think they offer the best economic opportunities. They do want to protect our environment, and the rest of the world has seen that we do that. We offer the option of sound economic growth 
protection for the environment, and low taxes. Not ridiculously low taxes, but taxes that allow families to keep most of the money that comes to them in their pockets, so they can spend the money on things that they want, not what other people want, or what other people tell them they should spend their money on, but what they should decide for themselves they'd like to spend their money on. That's the BC Liberal message. It's supporting families, it's supporting private enterprise, it's supporting our communities in British Columbia. And that's why I'd be proud to be your representative to take that strong voice to Victoria to make sure that you're heard in the legislature in Victoria. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, so much to the, uh, the Sydney Community Association and for all you folks for coming out and listening to us here tonight. Um, I, I started um, this conversation by suggesting there were two things you needed to be thinking about when you're electing your MLA. You need to be uh, electing someone who's going to stand up for the community, and I think I've walked the talk in that respect. In fact, I think I'm talking about issues that none of the other candidates are talking about. So I, I'd be the only one talking about truly affordable housing, about the need to improve public transit, about the need to avoid urban sprawl in this very precious rural landscape, about the National Marine Conservation Area. I'm the only one talking about those issues. Uh, I've lived, tried to do, done my best to live up to my commitments that I made in 2013 when I was elected, including trying to improve relations with First Nations. I worked with Adam on Grace Island. I worked with Stephen Roberts on BC Ferries. I've demonstrated that I'm quite capable and willing to work across party lines for the benefit of this constituency, and I will stand up when I'm counted and just one brief comment on Steelhead. The reason I waited eight months to announce my opposition was because as an MLA, not as a community activist, Adam and I are in different positions. As an MLA, I felt I had to do my due diligence on the project. I felt I had to understand what the heck were they were proposing before I took a position, and I did not take a position until a four with sandwich fans came out opposed to the project. I've discussed a number of things that we want to do as an NDP government. The only way to accomplish those transformational changes, $10 a day daycare, for younger families would be transformational. Making our tax system fairer would be transformational, would be good for the economy. Addressing ferry rates uh, would be transformational for the Southern Gulf Islands. But uh, there's one thing I haven't mentioned tonight. As, as critic for democratic reform, uh, the BC NDP is proposing to put back to voters changes in our voting system to a proportional uh, rep kind of voting system. And I'm very proud of the position that John Morgan has agreed with my recommendation to him after consulting with the public, after consulting with advocates, that an approval threshold of 50% plus one would be sufficient to change the voting system to a proportional representation system in British Columbia. That's the way we get cooperation among candidates, among parties in the legislature. We'll completely change the dynamic in the legislature, and our proposal will give British Columbia the best chance it's ever had in its history to have a fair voting system in British Columbia where every vote counts. But the way, the only way that is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, is if we change the provincial government in British Columbia. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to thank the uh, Sydney Community Association, Mona, and uh, my colleagues here uh, on the stage this evening. Um, uh, about a decade ago, my late grandmother, Laura, uh, asked me to come to her house. And she, she said to me, she reminded me of the responsibility that we Sandwich people have for, our, for the territory that we live in, to be stewards, to look after it. It's a central in inspiration, it's a central motivation is to follow through on the words that she shared with me, to, be, to stand up uh, for our riding and to represent our riding. And our, our territory is Saanich with pride. You know, I'm not gonna talk too much about, um, about the scandals that the BC Liberals under Christy Clark have, have just ongoing over and over and over again. I'm not gonna talk too much tonight about, at the closing here about the BC NDP and how they failed to inspire British Columbians for 16 years. Because if I'm doing that, then I'm not focusing on the hopeful vision that we BC Greens have for this province. You know, Andrew Weaver has shown that even one MLA can be exceptionally effective at upsetting the status quo. 
What you've heard tonight is that we need majority governments to get anything done, and I think that the, the underlying message, they talk right over top of, Brit of British Columbians, is that majority governments don't serve us as citizens, they serve political parties. What we need is more democracy. We need more diversity in our legislature. And the BC Greens have proven that we're good for democracy. Where we are elected into legislatures, the democracy increases. Where we've got strong candidates, the voter turnout goes up. Greens are good for democracy. There's three things that I want to leave you with tonight. First of all, we have a hopeful vision for British Columbia that addresses the education funding and increases education because we need to prepare British Columbians to get ready uh, for the emerging economy that's already on us. And we've taken real climate action. Despite what you've heard about the other parties and their climate action plan, it's the bottom of the line. The BC Greens are the only party that is proposing to meet the interim targets set by the climate action team for 2030. We are the only party that's going to achieve those goals, and climate change is about intergenerational equity. There's a stark contrast between the 20th century parties, establishment parties, and their, and their desire to have full control over the legislature, and the 21st century party, which is the BC Greens, that has a hopeful vision for our province. I've got uh, experience as a counselor in the District of Central Saanich and as an interim leader of the BC Greens. I'm a networker and a relationship builder, and I'm ready to represent our riding. We have an opportunity to shake up the status quo in Victoria, and you can guarantee that I'll be working with every single one of my uh, colleagues in the legislature as your next MLA. This is a decision about who you want to represent you, and I'm asking you, to place your trust in me and to place your vote in my care for the next four years. Heichka, thank you. So I'm uh, clearly a new face in politics and in for probably many of you besides my family in the back corner, you've never seen me before. <laughs> I, I have every intent that when I'm your MLA as an independent, I will do nothing but represent our riding, or our district, sorry. Um, I, I have no intent of just following party lines. I will continually talk to the constituents of, uh, well, can talk to you and the rest of the constituents about the issues that are happening and affecting our province. I uh, agree with Adam that one MLA can make a difference, and I would really uh, appreciate and be honored to have your support in this election. Um, if, you, if you agree with what I say and what I said tonight, please vote for me. I, on the other hand, though, I do believe that it is not the job of a candidate to convince you to vote for me. I believe it's the job of a candidate and all four of us here to give you political options, to provide you with the options to choose who you want to represent you. I have no intent to draw any one of you away from what you truly political, uh, politically believe. If you are dead set uh, to vote for another uh, member here, then I, I, I support you doing so, but please, if you agree with what I say, support me. And the issues that I have brought up will get a louder voice with every, uh, uh, every person I have supporting me. Thank you. enjoyed hearing so many answers to so many questions, so much information was given to all of us. So many people cooperated so that we could have this wonderful evening. Um, the people in the audience, the timekeepers again, you were essential. The candidates, and uh, to my, I see six commotion political science students out here. I'm so happy to see you here. I hope that you, you realize you are witnessing democracy in action, political participation in a riding where people do show up and vote. The last election, only 379 votes separated the winner from the uh, second place winner. <laughs> and, in, okay. and, and in Victoria, the last mayoralty race was won by 89 votes separating Dean Porton and Lisa Health. So voting matters. But I don't need to tell you that. You already show up. So um, thank you again for all your cooperation. Thank you.